Sixty years ago, Earth was attacked. We won the war, but they destroyed half the planet. Everyone's been evacuated. With a mop-up crew. This is Mission Control. Are you an effective team? We are an effective team. I'll buy you two a round of drinks when you get up here. Two more weeks, Jack, and we can finally leave and join the others. Don't take any chances. Jack is one of the last humans left on Earth after a massive war that has left Earth basically uninhabitable. Doesn't seem right. We won the war, now we have to leave. He's a futuristic blue-collar guy, basically. He fixes drones. He's fascinated with the relics of the past, the Yankees cap, which he finds. When he finds the structures of old Earth, there's a connection to it that he can't quite explain. Every day he goes down to Earth to do this job while trying to not get killed by the enemy. It's very dangerous whenever Jack's on the surface because he's always vulnerable to an ambush. <laughs> Jack and Vika are partners. She's his communication officer. Systems are green. You're cleared. Be careful out there. Well, he's am. No, you're not. Yeah, you're right. Gotta work on that. They've been stationed here together, just the two of them, for the past five years. One day, a spacecraft impacts near Jack's location. Drones are mobile. Keep your tech out of there. They are human. Jack, command wants you to stand down. The drones will handle this. That's a negative tower. They're firing on survivors. Jack is trying to figure out what is happening here. Stand down! This is insubordinate behavior. And in the wreckage, he finds this woman. Jack. How do you know my name? I've been watching you, Jack. It's time to learn the truth. You need to know what happened. Everything that he knows becomes inverted. What have you done? I can't protect you. Are you still an effective team? No, we are not an effective team. The people you work for lied to you. Jack knows he has to fight. Literally, the world is at stake. In this war. You don't have to die. They don't have to die. It's time to come home. I'm not gonna do that. It's epic. It's just an epic story. How are mankind to survive? This is the only way. When you look at this film, the level of artistry is pretty extraordinary. The idea was to find an environment that looked ravaged from a war, but yet had color, signs of life. I like the idea of doing a daytime science fiction movie because I felt like science fiction kind of went into the darkness, uh, went into the inside of spaceship holes, and I wanted to kind of bring it back out into the daylight. All right, Tet's coming in line in 30 seconds. Relaying coordinates now. Confirm visual. Joe Kaczynski truly is a visionary filmmaker. He's a world creator. The two words that I had from the very beginning of the project was a beautiful desolation. It's almost primordial Earth. Feels like Earth the way it maybe looked a million years ago. It has a haunting beauty to it. But against that rugged landscape, I wanted to bring a very clean, forward-looking technology. This is Jack Harper. I'm good to go. As an architect, Joe imagines things that are wild. The Sky Tower is a home built at 3,000 feet above the ground. Sounds good. Mark. And action. The Sky Tower is a, is a home built at 3,000 feet above the ground. This is almost like a station. It's almost like a military outpost. It's a living quarters, but it's also a working environment. It's a three-level home that's on this tiny little spindle. Obviously, that's not something you could build, but I felt like we could get close. Before the movie started principal photography, we went to Haleakala, a volcano in Maui. We set up three cameras that captured sky, cloud, sunrise, sunsets, stars, 
Then we took that footage and we front projected it on a massive screen that surrounded the set. It gave the film a very epic feeling. If we were to do this blue screen, all that blue that you'd see outside the windows would spill into all these surfaces and all this glass, and that would be a virtual nightmare to have to paint out and deal with in visual effects. So the opportunity to get that stuff in camera was the critical design feature in this whole set. There is no blue screen. I mean, what you're seeing is the final product. And we're able to you know, change the weather. It's sunset, and the next day is daylight, and we have night, and all the clouds are moving. It's all pretty amazing. And what that allowed us to do is to not only capture it in camera, but use the reflected light of that footage to actually light the sets and the actors. The lighting that you're getting on the actors' faces is the same type of light they get in a sunset because it's literally footage of a sunset. You end up with an all-in-camera visual effect and a visual quality that just can't be faked. And the actors really enjoy it too because they're actually in a place that has clouds surrounding them. <laughs> it does help as an actor uh, not acting green screen. It's interactive, so you don't have to try to imagine something. You're there with the other actors. It felt very organic. Now that was take two. It's fantastic. This is an amazing piece of art. I want to stay here and live here. I want to move in. Those designs are incredible. Joe filmed on top of volcano, cloud formation, sunrise, sunsets, and then he had those images projected, so that was the natural lighting. It was the clouds. It was Without a doubt, the most beautiful set I've ever shot on. Action. Allows them to even kind of immerse themselves more deeply in the story because they're surrounded by it. So that's something I'm really excited about that we were able to do on this movie. It's just so cool. Every piece of it was so smooth and elegant. This great visual world. Stand down! From the Sky Tower to the bubble ship, ultimately is an emotional experience. It's extraordinary, and it's epic. The whole philosophy for the movie was to try to shoot everything in camera, so we decided that it made sense to build a full-scale version of the bubble ship. Once you get the fuselage on, you can go anywhere. You can put the tail boom on, or you can do the cockpit. Did you get it in? We're finally getting the bubble ship assembled. This is the first time it's ever been pieced together, ever. We spent an hour and a half on creating it, finding all the parts. It's like Christmas morning, because we're getting everything out of the packages, you know, the bubble wrap of antennas in this thing. All right, what's the next steps, engines? All these studs mount to the plate on there. Got your fingers. Go ahead and go back and we'll come over. Hold on, hold on. Last night, drop it down a touch. I had no idea it was going to be like this, man. I'm shaking right now. Being able as a designer to participate on a movie where they build real vehicles, it's a designer's dream come true. Everything's fully assembled. Now we're just working on getting the lights fired up for tonight for Tom and Joe. Yeah, it's beautiful. This thing is cool. Can we pop the doors for God, that's beautiful. <laughs> Come on. Can I get in? Tom Cruise was super involved with everything. He came to the workshops where we built it. He had some input on the controls to make sure it felt as realistic as possible with the foot pedals and the control stick. It's so beautifully designed. Every piece of it was just smooth and elegant. Stunning. It was really exciting to get to share that moment with him. Good job, guys. All right. There's a couple different incarnations of the bubble ship. We have the complete bubble ship, and we have basically just the cockpit on a full motion-based gimbal. So we'll get all the flying footage, and then in visual effects, we will put the rest of the ship on the backside of that. Ready, and action. Tom is the pilot himself, so he's very comfortable with all this movement. Can we go a little faster? But Olga's never been on any kind of gimbal like this before. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Okay. Just relax. Look at me. Yeah. Okay, it'll be fun. <laughs> Olga will tell you today she wasn't scared. Have fun, Olga. She was scared. <laughs> oh, my God! bubble ship is a beautiful creation when it's just standing on the ground. But you don't want to be in there when it's flipping around. There you go. <laughs> At the end, I liked it, actually. I have to admit it. But don't tell anyone. I pretended like I didn't. <laughs> Great job. She's very brave. She toughed it out. And her performance in the movie is priceless because it's real. It's not acting. Are you OK? <laughs> no.
was listening to M83 when I wrote the story. So to be able to bring him on the actual film was a real thrill. I met with Joe Kosinski and loved the project, obviously. So of course I'm gonna do it, and it's my first score, so I'm very excited about it. Anthony's music is cutting edge, but it's also very emotional, and it felt like a good fit. My sound is very cinematic in a very electronic way. I was very inspired watching the pictures, and it was beautifully shot. When you first see Tom Cruise riding his motorcycle in this beautiful landscape, there's something very epic but very emotional at the same time. It's a collaboration between Joe Kosinski, Joe Trapanisi, and myself. Anthony has such a brilliant body of work behind them that has inspired me. So to learn from him as he's learning from me about film scoring, it really is a dream come true. The goal was to have something new that delivers power and epicness. When you have something so forward-thinking, you have to bring this same interesting element that you brought into the filmmaking into the music also. It sounds original, which is all I wanted. I wanted an original sound for an original film. So I want the real drums to start now. We recorded this original song for the end credits. And Susan Sanford is singing. She's so powerful and there's something majestic about her voice. She's one of a kind, I think. Working on this film was an amazing experience. This is our first day shooting in Iceland. It's uh, been an adventurous one. We did some aerial work yesterday, which was exciting, but today we embarked on uh, the first of what we hope is a couple weeks of very good filming here. I couldn't wait to go to Iceland. I've never been there, first of all. It's just absolutely stunning. It's just so fast, and it just seems to go on forever. And Joe's eye and how he shot it is just extraordinary. Yeah, that's nice. Action. The landscape looks like really no other place on Earth. It's a volcanic island, black sands, no trees. There's a beauty in the desolation there, and that seemed to kind of fit the aesthetic I wanted for oblivion. We were there when it was daylight for 24 hours. Right now, it's 9 o'clock at night, which I know the picture doesn't suggest it is, but it is 9 o'clock at night. You get what we call magic hour, which is where the sun's low in the sky. You get this beautiful light, and it lasts seven or eight hours. And from the filmmaker's point of view, it's an amazing opportunity to just get this beautiful light for hours on end. Nailed it. <laughs> There's just so many wonderful geothermal spots everywhere. You're just driving down the road, and you come across a geyser or a natural crater. We're in the very north of Iceland in an amazing crater. And uh, the crater's going to stand in ultimately for what'll be a uh, stadium. I'm coming in hot. Our character Jack arrives here to fix a broken drone that's been downed in some battle. Tech 49, Jack Harper. You know, I read about this game. It was played right here. Visual effects will put in the remainders of broken billboards and stadium seating. And he leaps out of the back. Touchdown! You'll get the sense that we're inside something that used to be pretty amazing. It's very unique. I haven't seen anything like this before. We shot on Earl's Peak, which is a mountain peak in the middle of Iceland, really in the middle of nowhere. Glaciers on one side, black sand desert on the other. It was one of those experiences that you dream about as a director, about going to places that most people have never seen and getting to capture it all in camera. 
Today is day 71 here in lovely Iceland. We are sort of out of the beaten track. We had to bring all our gear up here. Today we had seven buckets loaded up by our professional mountaineers, and then those were flung beneath an A-Star helicopter, and then we drop it here depending on where we need it. Basically all the people have to be flown in. We got helipads down here. Bring everybody up in the Coast Guard helicopter. The Icelandic Coast Guards helped us out a lot today, so we're happy for that. That took a lot of planning. We had 50 people up there with hair and makeup, wardrobe, props, camera grips, two techno cranes. Safety-wise, it's a tricky place to shoot. You gotta get safety gear. People need to have helmets on because it's easy to slip here and also quite steep. So we had to put up handrails, anchors, safety lines. If you need to go outside of the rope area for work purposes, you have to be harnessed. No one has shot here before and we have actually never brought crew of this size and all that equipment up on a location like that. So far, so good. The trick will be getting the shot Joe wants and then getting home. Oh, here we go. This is awesome. Yeah. Earl's Peak, beautiful. I love Earl's Peak. <laughs> That's what I need to... Uh, what do we need to do? It's incredible. Because we were so well prepared, as soon as he landed, we were able to shoot very quickly. Can I walk? Yes, sir. You're, yep. good. You're good to go. We are rolling, please. Rolling. Let's the only kill stick. We're uh, shooting Tom on the top of a 2,000-foot precipice. And action. It was just incredible. I mean, you've got Tom Cruise on the very edge of that peak with the most beautiful light. It was just one of those days I'll never forget. It was amazing, you know, just to sit there and get to see so much of the country. We're gonna do a little rappelling at lunch, guys. <laughs> you will not find too many actors out there who will go the distance like he does. He's the most committed actor I've ever worked with. And cut. Good. Nice. It was to his chagrin that we ended so quickly, and he decided that he'd like to stay a little longer on his own. So we got all the equipment off. He stayed up there and enjoyed the view for a while. It was really peaceful. It was so beautiful. And I think, you know, when you see the film, it captured it. It captured that haunting beauty and kind of serenity. Here we go. Fire the hole, full rose reading room of the New York Public Library for that sequence at the beginning of the movie. I'm set. So we get to see Tom rappel into that space. He gets involved with a little bit of trouble down there, so we have some really cool stunts. The library turns out to be a trap. It's a big action sequence that plays out in there. Three, two, one, four! Ah. Oh. Ah. This production, as far as the action is concerned, has been loaded up front. Here we go, action! That was easier making it than not making it. He's able to perform the stunts usually better than 99% of all stunt people. And I'm done. Nailed it. Sweet. Fun. We test everything out. Hey, Tom, this is okay, but you don't want to put your foot down. You don't want it to catch on anything. When I do have a loaded weapon, I don't want people standing yeah. around the sides. As we have to keep him safe, he also knows that he has to keep himself safe. Can you turn it against his right body like that? And this is tight, right? There you go, that's it, perfect. Lars doesn't hit me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> We're dropping debris. We use balsa wood. It's real light, breaks easy. Let's stand by for picture. Weapons hot. Here we go, on a bow. Fire the hole. Three, two, one, action. <laughs> it's been stunt after stunt, which is normal for
signing out TP. Thanks for watching our video. Don't forget to watch our other videos including our top 10 upcoming horror films of 2013 and our extensive behind the scenes inside looks of recent and upcoming films.